Welcome to this evening's program. This is the last in the series of climate explorations talks that we've had uh, both last fall and this spring. We welcome Dr. Peter Curtis to present this evening. Peter is a professor in the Department of Evolution, Ecology, and Organismal, Organismal Biology at The Ohio State University. Dr. Curtis's research focuses on plant and ecosystem responses to global change, including rising atmospheric carbon dioxide, altered climatic drivers such as temperature and precipitation, and changes in land use and community composition. Peter's research combines above canopy eddy covariance flux measurements, ground-based near-surface remote sensing, chemical analysis of canopy foliage, and biometric carbon storage and counting methods to evaluate the effects of changing canopy structure and biological complexity in forest carbon storage potential. His team has identified mechanisms, mechanisms supporting sustained high carbon storage in aging and old growth mixed deciduous forests in the upper Great Lakes region. Thank you, Dr. Curtis. We'd also like to thank, as he's coming up, the uh, Franklin Park Conservatory and Botanical Gardens, who are hosting us this evening, and also C. Grant, who is uh, providing the broadcast this evening to the audience and all the people that have joined us in person from the Bird Polar Research Center at The Ohio State University. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jason. Um, it's really nice to be here on a cold day, uh, Earth Day, um, and uh, talking both to the folks here at the Franklin Park Observatory as well as those who are joining us online. Um, so I'm going to talk about here a little bit about the research I'm going to do. I'm going to touch on that, but this is not going to be a a data-heavy talk. I'd rather like to talk about something that's really apropos for Earth Day, thinking a little bit about stewardship uh, and the way that we uh, approach that. And I'm going I'm to try to keep this as local, pretty local. Are you picking up all right? Uh, yep. Feedback there? Or not feedback. <laughs> no feedback. Uh, I'm talking a little bit about Ohio, and Ohio is interesting in this regard about stewardship and, and uh, something I think about a lot. Um, so I talk about here, I talk about an era of rapid climate change, but I was thinking about that term era, and maybe epic is a better term because as some of you maybe may know, we're actually in a new geological epic. And if I can, if I can just oh, there we go. So we're now in the Anthropocene, right? So this is a new geological era or epic, I think. Um, and again, apropos for Earth Day, uh, we're kind of in charge now. We're in charge of the whole planet. I think that's something that we have to really understand. I, I want to actually acknowledge the economists. I stole that from one of their uh, illustrations from one of their, their covers. Um, but yeah, we're, uh, we are really our stewards of the whole planet now. We have to think about the tools that we have and the challenges that face us. So here we are. Welcome to the Anthropocene on Earth Day. Um, so, I want to give a little roadmap of where I'm going with this, with the themes I'd like to cover. Um, I do want to give you a snapshot. I'm not going to go into some detail about some of the challenges, um, stewardship challenges that we face in Ohio in particular. Um, I also want to give you a sense of some of the tools that are out there. And again, I think this is a message that people need to hear, is that we're not just casting about in the dark. There are people from researchers like myself, to policymakers, to managers who have really thought hard about this. And we now have some real tools and things which are available to us so that we can make informed decisions. I'm gonna, I am going to give you a, a little bit of a tour of the sorts of things that we do in the Northern Great Lakes. Not uh, dissimilar to the forests that are down here in Ohio, particularly studying resilience. And this is a, will be a theme I'm coming back to. Um, as we think about responses of ecosystems to climate change, or any disturbance for that matter, the degree to which they're resistant or resilient to those disturbances. And finally, I'd like to highlight a couple of ideas in stewardship. I'm going to focus on forests. It's not the only ecosystem, but it's an important one in Ohio um, as we go forward. What are some of the new directions out there? So that's where we're going to go. Um, so Ohio. Is not uh, is warming like every place else, and I, and I probably don't need to convince you of that. But I'm going to show you some data um, that gives you a sense of the magnitude of that and the variation. And so um, here's Ohio, and we're actually fortunate. Uh, not every state has had the level of, of monitoring of temperatures that Ohio has, and so we're home to I think it's 18 of these little stars, long-term climate, well, historic climate monitoring stations. 
where temperatures have been recorded beginning, well, we have we have good records back in 1895. So we're looking at, you know, 120, 125 years worth of good temperature data that has actually been corrected and really really archived very well. And a student of mine who's just finishing her dissertation is interested in climate change and flowering time has aggregated some of those data. So uh, that's Kellen Callinger. It's a published data. But um, they simply show here spring temperatures statewide over this, this period, actually 1895 to 200, uh, 2013, so 118 years. Um, and then in one county. But the point here simply is that statewide we've seen in our spring advancing about a degree and a half Fahrenheit. So measurable significant increases. And this is fairly congruent with what we see globally. But this is variable depending on where you are. So Trumbull County, which is right up here in northeastern Ohio, has their springs have warmed significantly more than that statewide average, only really three and a half degrees Fahrenheit. So certainly warming is <laughs> it's happening. Pushing you back now. Well, I'm getting close to my slides. That's okay. Um, so we are certainly uh, experiencing that, and we have to think about that as a challenge. It's not like we sit apart from what's happening globally, and we can look at that statewide, or we can think about it more, more locally, even within counties, for example, that might have warm differentially compared to others. So what might this mean, and what may some of the other factors that are related to climate change uh, mean? Well, one of the ways that we can get at this when we think about ecosystems is to look at organisms, right, and to track their abundance over time, how, how common they are, and this is something that Kellen, my student, has been doing. Exactly. Um, and so these are herbarium records. So she's gone to the OSU herbarium and looked at where people have collected plants over time. And she's compared where the records are for those plants historically, going back, actually, in many cases, well, this is back to 1895, through this what we call a historic period. So pre climate warming, or at least big uptick. And then comparing that with modern records. So have there been changes in distribution or abundance and then distribution? I'll show you some distribution here in a second. <laughs> illustrate the challenges and the approaches that we might use. And so this is, so for example, over here, the bristly buttercup shows the historic data are in the black dots. And you can see sort of widely distributed. But in the white dots, this is the modern period, even more widely distributed. So this plant has actually increased its abundance doing better with the bucket buttercup or anunculus compared to historically. So this might, in the broad context of things that have happened, might be a winner in this regard. But we can contrast that with another species, one again you might be familiar with, the Indian paintbrush. And again, here we can see the historic distribution of black dot really quite widespread north to south across the state. Locally, or more recently, it's really been restricted to down in the southern part of the state near the Ohio River. So here's a species which is clearly decreasing in abundance. So we have to pay attention to these. These are conservation concerns which could be exacerbated by warming. If these plants are, are able to respond to that. Land use change, other pollutants, speed of issues which might come into play. Um, Kellen's also looked at broadly at distribution of how many counties the species occur in. In this case, again, going back to these old herbarium records, it's a great resource. It's fun talking in the, in the conservancy, the conservatory here. I mean, if we're coming from a herbarium, we can use these great historical records and actually look at the effects of changes over time. And in this case, actually, it's a, it's a really quite sobering picture. This is just that there are 207 angus for flowering plants that she looked at, which you could get good data from. And 68% of those are showing a contraction in their distribution across the state of Ohio. Only, what, 6% are expanding their range. So again, a conservation challenge, a stewardship challenge as we think about biodiversity in these systems, how we may, we, we may need to uh, respond to that. Uh, without the data, though, we wouldn't be able to make reasonable decisions. So certainly our challenge. Um, now, I'm going to focus the rest of my talk. This was that was a broad diversity of flowering plants, including trees, a lot of, a lot of uh, herbaceous species as well. 
Ohio is fundamentally a forested landscape. Pre-European pre settlement, 60 to 70 percent of the land cover was in forest. Low point in the early part of the, the 20th century, maybe 12 or 15 percent. We're back up to around 30 percent now. So the forests are expanding, and they're actually doing quite well, accumulating substantial amounts of biomass. They're expanding. They're storing carbon. And uh, and so and this is an important part of this this natural land surface, the natural land cover that we need to manage. In fact, it's the home to many of those those um, flowering plants that I showed you data on earlier. The remarkable thing about Ohio, this is really different from, for example, Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, some of the northern lake states. It's who are the stewards? And I this is time to sort of look focus this talk and thinking about who's making the decision. This is my feeling is often lost in this conversation. We're, we're often talking to big forest owners and people who are interested in running mills or supplying mills. It's very interesting. In Ohio, 86% of the land of the forest cover is, is in private holdings. This is very different, for example, from the West or certainly from the Northern Lake States, which is on the other order of two-thirds of them in public holdings. So here in Ohio, we've got 86% that's this purple and the orange. 71% is in family forest. And these are, the vast majority of these are people who own less than 50 acres. And in fact, 56% of looking at the numbers today of these family forests are people who own less than 10 acres. So the people who are on these small landowners are, are making decisions about stewardship of the majority of the forest cover the natural landscape of Ohio. And so the, the management options, the strategies that we come forward with have to be relevant for the family farm, the family owner, the family landowner. I don't know if anybody here owns small bits of forest land. I own a little bit in New England. And you sort of think about it, you think, oh, this doesn't really matter. But in aggregate, this is hugely important for conservation and stewardship in the state of Ohio. This with people, which I find really fascinating. So what what do they think? And so the Forest Service sort of recognizes this is the data that they collect, and they actually do surveys of ownership attitudes and why they what's important to them as landowners. And this is a real also really illustrative and kind of hints at the theme here, which is that many of the standard forestry and sort of management techniques that are out, out there are not aimed at the interests of a small landowner, actually. So what are they what are the what are the reasons that uh, for ownership by these individuals? Primary reasons that I'm the title here is timber production is simply not even close to the top of that list. And so here are the top, you know, sort of ten reasons for owning land given by these family forest owners. Top ones, aesthetic, nature protection, privacy as part of their homework heaven. Way down here, 20% or fewer than that in terms of owners, timber production or even non-timber forest products. So the extractive part of managing is not nearly and not close to the top of the priority for people who are actually making the stewardship decision. So I think that to me this is an important message in thinking about what are we, what's the advice that we give the small landowner in Ohio and it's really important to think about that. They're the ones who are making the important decisions. So the good news is that people are thinking about this. And I have to really do a shout out to my colleagues in the U.S. Forest Service. We have an excellent group at, the, at our Delaware lab, just north of Columbus here, you know, it's the minutes up the road, doing some of the pioneering work on climate change. And they're, and very recently, actually in this last year, um, federal mandate to come up with climate hubs for risk adaptation and mitigation uh, across North America. And so we have a Midwestern hub, we have a Northeastern. Actually, we have, we are fortunate, we have actually two centers here, one in Ames and also one up in Houghton, Michigan. A uh, few colleagues up in Houghton. Again, really doing very good work. You can go to this site, you can click on the Midwest, for example, you'll come up with a set of uh, issues that you need to be thinking about, not just for forests, actually, but for other uh, types of land cover as well. So this, is, this, is, this represents, if you go to the site and think about these resources and look at them, some of the best thinking that's going on, and they need to be better publicized. It's hard to know.
know sometimes if you know if they publicize this, somebody's going to say you can't talk about climate change or something like that. I mean, this is no. But as it stands, this is, these are excellent resources, and the one that I'm going to highlight is this one. And actually, I brought my copy with me here if anyone would like to look at this. This is a, a, a handbook that was produced a couple of years ago by the U.S. Forest Service called Forest Adaptation Resources. Climate change tools and approaches for land managers. And this is not a, this is not an exhaustive how-to list for everybody from Ponderosa, somebody managing Ponderosa pine, to somebody managing you know white oak here in Ohio. But it sets out some very well thought out prescriptions. And I'm going to again highlight some of these um, that are based on science, but actually I think can also be adapted for the small landowner. It's something that we should be paying attention. to. So really good resources. Uh, people are doing good work, and it needs to be recognized and, and more broadly advertised. I think. Okay. So what are they? What what are some of the things? What what are what the experts? I guess U.S. Forest Service. When we think about uh, managing and steward, stewarding our uh, these lands, what what's their framework? So they come up with what they call an adaptive management approach. Let landowners integrate these climate change considerations into management decisions. Now, this is a very logical and actually very uh, a robust uh, strategy approach. And I'm just going to touch on some of these. I'm going to highlight. I'm going to highlight two. But of course, you need to know where you are, or the kind of ecosystem you're working with. It's very important in many cases to establish partnerships, local extension, uh, other neighboring land uh, owners, for example, local government, whoever that might be. Then and we're going to talk about in more detail assessing the vulnerability. So not all ecosystems are equally vulnerable. And then really consider what those adaptation strategies and approaches should be. Go ahead and implement them, monitor their effectiveness, and you can go back and sort of redo things as you need. So this is a logical sort of a management plan. Um, and they, the two that I want to highlight, sort of right here in the middle, is this idea of assessing ecosystem vulnerability. And ask the question, how vulnerable actually are forests in Ohio climate change? And then what might be sort of the key adaptation and adaptation and strategies and approaches uh, that the small landowner as well as the large might think about implementing to help mitigate and increase resilience, mitigate climate change and increase resilience in the system. This is, uh, so the first one I'm going to tackle is this, is this top one, assessing ecosystem vulnerability, vulnerability to climate change. And the approach that's laid out makes a lot of sense, and, it, and they've got quite a bit of science to go behind it. But in, a, in effect, oops, Okay, so we'd like to know how the adaptive capacity of an ecosystem. I know that, so to what extent is this, can this adapt to disturbance or change? And accept my word that this varies across ecosystems. And we'll see actually that in fact the domestic forests of Ohio are really quite adaptive. But then we need to combine that with what are the potential impacts? How much warming can occur? How much maybe precipitation change, for example? Storm frequency, the other sorts of disturbance event factors that influence ecosystems. So that you, if you have low potential impact in a high system of low or moderate adaptive capacity, you have moderate to or to high impact, you could be in a very high vulnerability condition. It's very important to think about the strategy to know where you fit in this adaptive landscape. So, this is sort of the good news slide, and um, there's some sort of sidebars on this. But the, but the Forest Service, actually, this is the National Climate Assessment published in two, 2014, in which they looked at three different forest sites in this, in this particular chart. Western forest, so in the much drier part of the country, drier eastern forest, so this might be forest in western Ohio, in, in Indiana, for example, if you go further west or up on ridges in drier areas, or wetter, wetter eastern forests. And then here's the potential impact down here, different degrees of warming. 
And then the question is, to what extent are these different systems vulnerable to these kinds of impacts? And the good news is actually these weather eastern forests, which really characterize a majority of the forests in Ohio, where it's classic sort of mesic, eastern mesic or wet forests, have a good deal of adaptive capacity. And so their vulnerability, even to fairly, fairly high warming, is relatively low. So this is good news, and I think it's not one that I that we should shy away from. Recognize that very different from a western ponderosa or, or uh, juniper forest, for example, which are highly vulnerable to changes in precipitation. But the climate forecasts in Ohio are warming and perhaps a dis different distribution in precipitation. But these are changes which our particular suite of species are reasonably well able to handle. So we need to recognize that. Now, some of our drier forests, given greater warming and certainly increased uh, drought due to that, move into a higher vulnerability category. But we're fortunate, in, particularly in we're away from the coast, in an area with ample precipitation, that our systems have a good degree, quite a high degree of ecological resilience or adaptability. So we'll think about that. We'd like to increase that. Okay, so that's our, that's our, okay, so how, what's the vulnerability, where are we, seems to be fairly low, could be moderate, what might our adaptation strategies be, look like? And uh, so again, my sort of list here, I'm not going to go over all of them, you can see what some of these are, reducing the impact of existing biological stressors, this might be things like air pollution, for example, acid runoff from mines. Um, pests, I think that's another one up here. Uh, protecting forests from other kinds of severe disturbances like fire, wind, wind, wind throw, the fugia for rare species, all the way down here to genetic diversity. But the one that I'm going to focus on, and this is the one that I think is the key, wandering away from the Microsoft. This is the one that I think of, is, is key, and one that can be implemented at a whole variety of scales, is this one right here in the middle. This is enhancing structural and species diversity. And just those things, diversity, both in terms of species numbers and in, in, in structure, and I'm going to show you what I mean by that, can help tremendously in the resilience and the resistance of the And so if there's one message that I want to put forward, it's just that, that we need to be thinking about reducing homogeneity, increasing diversity, both structural and biotic diversity in these systems. And we can do that. And it's happening to some degree naturally, but this is a, these are management tools that individuals at one acre, 10 acres, 50 acres, 1,000 acres can uh, pursue. So how might that, what, what might that look like? Oh, okay, so, I think that was the last one. Okay, so this is gonna, we're going to get into sort of the science part of this. I'm going to introduce you to some of the work that we do that reflects on these things, particularly the structural and the biotic diversity. Now, maybe I'm biased towards those, but I do think these are key ecological attributes that we need to pay attention to. So, I've spent the last 25 years studying climate change and carbon dynamics, uh, not so much in Ohio, but further north. And actually, my research site is up here in northern lower Michigan. I uh, would say the tip of the mitt. I'm sure some of you have been up there in your Mackinac City. It's a wonderful place to, to work. Um, it's actually a facility uh, that's run by the University of Michigan, which is somewhat ironic as a faculty member from Ohio State. Um, they let me in up there anyway. Actually, we get along just great. Um, a great colleague. Um, and it's actually the University of Michigan Biological Station. And there we've established what we call the Forest Carbon Cycle Research Program. And here are some of the principal investigators. And it's a really multi institutional group. Uh, Ohio State, Michigan, we've got people in Indiana, for example, and Wisconsin, Minnesota, it's kind of a Big Ten uh, mafia out there. Good colleague at Virginia Commonwealth down in Richmond, Virginia. Um, here's, our, here's the gang a year, a year or two ago. And I do also need to always very, very careful to point out this work has been funded for many years by the U.S. Department of Energy, um, who have a great deal of interest in the consequences of our energy use, and to their credit, have funded basic ecological research 
quite a, quite a long time. I certainly funded my research for essentially my whole career at Ohio State. But this is where we are. So that's the gang. White carbon, white carbon storage report. This is the ecosystem service that we focus on. A um, number of reasons, but the one that I'm going to highlight has to do with its role as a carbon sink. So we know that CO2 is produced in lots of different sources. We call these sources of CO2. And I like this illustration from a colleague, Tony King, he's at Oak Ridge. Uh, so we have a variety of sources. Of course, the one that we often focus on is fossil fuel emissions, but there are lots of natural sources of CO2 as well. And these are emitted in landscapes. These are all from sources, disturbance, land use change, fossil fuel emissions. Uh, methane and uh, emissions from livestock, for example. But these sources are stored in sink. Uh, that we, and uh, that's, the, that's the parlance, there's sources in sink. And some of these include harvested products, storage and things like wood, but also in ecosystem. And so uh, in an, in an ag both agricultural and natural ecosystem. But from a variety of lines of evidence, we know that forests are the primary and largest terrestrial sink for this atmospheric CO2. So they're part of that mitigation in terms of pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere that we put in through fossil fuel combustion, fossil fuel use. They also, of course, for us also provide habitat for everything else. So, in fact, again, often lost sight of in the conversation, the focus on carbon is all the old critters and, and little wildflowers and so forth that don't store a lot of carbon, but they're part of this mix of diversity. And for many of them, not all, but many of them, the forests are their home. And so the degree to which we're stewarding forests, we're providing habitat for many, many species. Uh, many of them not particularly charismatic or showy or back or very well known for that matter. Okay. And you know, with this work, and I out to do a shout out to the Sea Grant, I think it's part of the group here. Um, We've, we've partnered with the people who are much better graphics than we are to illustrate where does the carbon go in a typical Great Lakes forest. And so this is these, these, this illustration comes from some of our data. It just gives you a sense of some of the things that we do. So we're, we're like carbon accountants. Where does it come in? Where does it go out? Where is it stored? And if you have a good year or a bad year, a half of it's down there in organic matter, another 40% in the trunk, only 1% in the leaves, you know, woody debris, roots, and so forth. There are about 80 tons an acre in this ecosystem. We can quantify how much is coming in from photosynthesis, how much is being lost in restoration, and the difference is how much is stored in any given year. We've been interested in, okay, fine, how does that change over time? And what happens as the forest age or as they're disturbed from climate change? And what might help them be more resistant to those disturbance effects as regards this Important ecological service. Okay, how do we do this? This is the this is the fun part for me. So uh, we have a number of really kind of G whiz science tools that we that we use to monitor carbon dioxide dioxide exchange, CO2 exchange. And Jason mentioned one word which probably went right by a lot of you: the eddy covariance flux method. And that's what this is. And so. Um, People train like me, but we like big toys, and so this is one of them. We build towers, sort of like cell towers, um, but they stick up above the forest, and we instrument them, and we can monitor 10 times a second the amount of CO2 going into the forest and the amount of CO2 coming out of the forest. And if there's more going in than going out, there's an uptake, which happens during the day and during the summertime. If there's more going out than going in, it's been lost, and that happens, of course, at night and during the wintertime. So we do this 10 times a second, 24-7, 365 days a year. We've been doing it since 1999. So this gives us a very fine-grained view of what's going in and out of what's like in and out of the top of the box of that forest. It's like putting a box over it. And we can tell what's going in and out very, very quickly, very, very precisely. And we're not alone in this regard. Not to say we're part of a network, and the DOE has funded many of these. Um, this is uh, a little snapshot of all the different towers. We're right out here, and we actually run another one over here. Um, part of the network of these towers that are recording CO2 exchange in different kinds of ecosystems, forests, grassland, agricultural, and so on, of the Ameriflex network. And this is a, there's actually a, in Europe and, and in the tropics and Australia and so forth. And 
So uh, it's like actually turning into a very powerful network now of people doing this kind of work. We're proud to be part of that. Um, but in addition, so you have the fancy stuff on the tower, and this is really where I come in. I'm an ecologist. I partner with meteorologists and engineers to do the fancy stuff on the towers. It's all about partnering and actually and teamwork building. We run around like maniacs, it's like finding the missing penny. We know there's a lot of CO2 coming in on the top of the box. We like to know where is it. If you tell me there's a ton of carbon, you think you'd be able to find it, right? Is it in the leaves? Is it in the root? Is it in the bug? Where is it? And how, what, how long is it going to be there? Is it going to be there for a long time? Or is it going to be gone in the next year? Or if there's an insect outbreak, for example. So we run around and looking at it, you know, under here, is it up here? Is it climb up in towers, down in the dirt, in the soil, and so forth. So we spend a lot of time doing that. Oh, this is a map. we are looking down at our study site, and the towers in the middle, and these, these uh, lines are just transects, and each one of these is a permanent plot. We study these very intensively to get a sense of what's going out, actually, in the footprint of the tower. Because the tower senses 30, 40, 50 acres at a time, so it's an integrated picture. You have to match that on the ground. So, Let's see, what do we find? Okay, so I'm going to focus on, we have to say we've collected a lot of information over the years. I want to talk about two things. I really want to show, showcase this, this idea about structure, partly because it's just another, for me, it's just way fun, it's kind of a gee whiz thing. Uh, so what we found is that forest plots that are more structurally complex have higher carbon stores, so they have a greater ecosystem service. They perform more of the ecosystem. How do we do that? Um, so this is that map of our study site. And we use a laser range finder to do this. And I just think this is quite cool. So if you look at one of these plots, they're 32 meters in diameter. And my other former student of mine is now at a Boston University who such a pioneered this technique. You can walk through the forest with a laser range finder, we call a LIDAR system. And that bounces, you can bounce uh, there's my little graphic there. You can bounce near infrared laser pulses, you know, and they just bounce off everything as you're walking through the woods, right? And you can map that, and this is sort of this is what it looks like. So you can create an image, a 2D panel through the woods. For each one of these colored bars is how much stuff is above you. And so we can we now actually have a tool which we didn't really have before of actually measuring the functional complexity. So like up here, this is an emergent tree. This is up around 20 meters. Here's a gap over here. Here's a big gap in the understory and so forth. So we can, we can quantify that. When you do that, you need a good word. So we've coined the term rugosity. That's over here. I'll show you just a teeny bit of data. We like that term. And our colleagues seem to like it too. So you have to have a cool term. So we are able to quantify this. And if you do a bunch of these side by side, can come up with a very cool three-dimensional image of that complexity of the system. So, to, so what we've got here is just that, where the intensity of the color going to the red is more leaf area that's up there, more, more stuff to store carbon. And this is the 30-year-old stand over here, a young stand, not very complex. Here's an 85-year-old stand, lots of gaps, tree falls, and dead trees. Stuff sticking up. It kind of looks like kind of a mess. In fact, a typical forest or an old school forest would say, cut that down, time to start over. You want a, you want a nice 30 year old forest. And it's true, these guys are growing like gangbusters, but they're very homogeneous, structurally simple, and biotically simple as well. They're all early successional species. This is almost all aspen and birch. But by the time you get to 85 years, you have pine coming in, you've got some beech, you've got some. Oaks, for example, got other species of maple. And what we found, and what has really made a big splash, is that, is that the more complex you get, so the more of a ghost you are, that the more carbon, this is the amount of wood that's grown, actually, net primary production of wood. And so as this is age, they get more complex, and this complexity is a key feature of their ability to store carbon. And we're working through some of the details of that. But that was really quite exciting. And um, illustrate the importance of the structural complexity in the way the systems work. To say nothing of the fact that 
habitat is more variable. You've got different strata. You've got dead wood on the ground. So the inherent biotic complexity of these systems is also going on. Okay. So that's the structural complexity. Important, and certainly it's, you know, it's a big theme of our current research. But we've also found that when we increase the biological complexity, the number of species, the systems are also importantly more resilient. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. The data is complicated. It's nicely illustrated in this cartoon. The bottom line is higher biodiversity is greater ecological resilience to disturbance. There's a lot of theory that goes behind this, and there's a lot of data. Not too much from forests because they're harder to study. But what we found is that when we had small areas, simple, some of those plots that had just the early successional species, just that aspen and birch, if they grew up got older, if there was a disturbance, their productivity just plummeted. There was nothing there to sort of fill in the gap. So in plots that had greater diversity, there were some pine in the understory, there was some oak, there was some beech, there was some cherry. If a species was taken out, the aspen, the aspen started to die, which was starting to do, no problem. Other species are just going to grow in and moderate the effects of that disturbance. Ten caterpillar comes in, hammers the aspen. Well, they don't really do anything to pine, and pine can grow in. So that diversity helps maintain the resilience, helps buffer you against the disturbances. And we think, and I think some good evidence, that this is going to be critically important as climate change progresses. We need that resilience in the system to maintain their services. Okay. I'm going to kind of wrap up here. Um, so where do we, how does this relate to management? And this is kind of a complicated slide. I'm going to sort of walk you through this. this is sort of new direction in forest stewardship. This, what I'm talking about, this complexity, is not part of the typical suite of recommendations, tools that people in silviculture and growing trees for commercial use have been as part of their lexicon. And this is a, a, a a plot that I, I borrowed from a, a book on silviculture, actually progressive silviculture, which essentially is putting out a two axis, one on structural complexity, going from simple to complex, and unmanaged to managed in terms of management intensity. We can go from early forest or after disturbance, so a clear cut or a blowdown. And so you start there, and that might look like something like this. And if you're in a management program, you can think about minimally Managing that through thinning and natural regeneration, uneven age stand management, all the way up to the most heavily managed as in, in clear cuts and intensive plantations, of which of Michigan, for example, there are lots of them. Red pine plantations are all over the place. And these are essentially monoculture, even age. Red pine is great if what you need is a telephone pole. And, uh, but there's very little else there. And these are we would argue extremely unresilient to any disturbance. If something comes in and hits good pine, you've got nothing else in that system. On the other hand, natural succession will take you from the early forest over time, and this may take 150 years, to something that's considerably more complex, and we would argue considerably more resilient to climate change, as well as actually having greater mitigation potential because of the sustained carbon uptake. So that would be the default. This is a little picture from the Porky, actually, the Porcupine Forest. And some of you may know from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, where that's a beautiful old growth stand. That's, actually, that's old second growth. So, what, so, this is what we have. What we need, and what we're arguing, and other, I think, progressive foresters are arguing, is that we need tools, more management tools, to get us into this phase here, where there's some management, but we're increasing the complexity. We need new management tools. Most is structural, compositional, and functional complexity, and I would add to that that are targeted in Ohio as a small landowner. You don't need to be talking about a thousand acres. What, what do you do if you're a, if you own 20 acres and you'd like to increase structural complexity? What's a what's a reasonable approach? You need those additional tools. And but new, more good news: other people are out there working on this problem. We've been Really fortunate to miss now partner with the Nature Conservancy. Great partners, Deep Pockets, which is really great. Uh, as a, it's not as deep as the DOE, but they're still really good people to be working with. Uh, this is uh, one of their uh, 
a really showcase project up on the Two-Hearted River, which is a beautiful uh, river in, uh, on the Upper Peninsula, made famous by Ernest Hemingway. He was up there. Uh, and their goal, this was a, they're managing uh, even a sugar maple stand, quite large. And they'd like to bring that into more complex old growth conditions fairly rapidly. They don't want to wait 150 years. What can you do to do that? And that's sort of their goal down here. How, more, how can we more quickly obtain this natural diversity of species, structural attributes, and so on? And what they've done, and this is a sort of an aerial view of this experiment that we're now participating in with our, our laser range kind of thing, is that they have cut holes in the forest of different sizes and different distributions to try to mimic, mimic these natural disturbances to create structural heterogeneity that will then allow other species to migrate into these openings and thereby increase the complexity. Are they the right size? Is this the right spacing? This was paired with timber extraction, so they're actually working with foresters. So this is not just for pie in the sky. There was an economic return on this, but they refer to this as their spotted hardwood. It looks like it's got uh, you know, chicken pox or something there. So, uh, so we're partnering with them, with them on this to look at a management approach combined with our ecological analyses to see whether or not this is taking us further in that direction. And could you use this kind of an approach or something else, smaller grass gaps for smaller land on smaller land holders. And um, so that's very exciting. We're really, really happy to partner with them. So let's, um, I think I'm just about out of time. We're coming to the end here. Um, a few concluding thoughts from this on Earth Day. Um, one um, is that indeed Ohio's, e Ohio's ecosystems are facing lots of challenges. But they can also benefit from a considerable natural ecological resilience. And if we recognize this, we can think about ways to promote it. Uh, fortunately, and it needs to be publicized, that there are planning tools that are available that in that enable sound, time, space, adaptation, spread, and form. I argue that a key practice for climate change adaptation and mitigation is to maintain and enhance species and structural diversity, a key trait that we need to focus on. And finally, to go back to that point I've been harping on, I guess, that in Ohio, poor stewardship rests largely with family landowners, and the strategies that we propose have to be tailored to this important group. So with that, I want to make a final little note here. Of course, I've been talking about Ohio. We sit in a larger area, even a bigger one, and you know, we uh, so we're thinking locally or acting locally. <laughs> Think globally is really important. Uh, climate change is affecting the whole planet. And uh, thank you, and, uh, and thank you to all the people who are here and also the uh, joining us online. So I'm open for questions from the audience, from here, from out in the internet. We'll, we'll just ask you to repeat the question, so make sure that the audience. Okay, understand. I can do that. Yes, uh, yes. I think drought kind of affects pests like the forests in the in the uh, west. They can be, come down to the pests, and maybe in Ohio we have the emerald ash borer. Do you see any relationship between uh, climate change and pests and pestation? Well, okay. So the question is the, this relationship between pests. And climate change? And the answer is absolutely yes. And particularly where you have, well, two things. I mean, the drought is a stressor. So in many cases, plants, trees become more susceptible to stressors or to pests when they're stressed. So we know that. A very interesting one, this is what's driving the northern expansion of the um, western pine beetle, for example, is now with, climate, with warming, you can get multiple generations. You get a much a faster turnaround in survivorship of these pests further north. And that's a huge issue, particularly in the Canadian and the Northern Rockies, and the Canadian Rockies, enormous. Um, now, in many cases, those are native defoliating insects. Emerald ash borer is another case. And we don't, this was, of course, imported. There's no resistance by our native ashes to this, to the, to the, to this insect. Um, 
we don't, right now, there's no known interaction between climate change per se and, for example, animal ash borer. We have to be vigilant in terms of invasive species, particularly invasive pests and pathogens like that. Um, Ohio, you know, it's an interesting question. This has to do with this resilience, where we sit. The precipitation is key. If things become a lot drier, then the habitat and the vulnerability shifts very rapidly. The climate projections from Ohio indicate probably an increase in precipitation in the winter, perhaps a decline in the summertime. That, that's, the jury's still out on that. Um, and that would extend sort of a band north of here as well. Those same issues states are true in the, north, in the Great Lakes region as well. Shifts as you go further east, further west in terms of drought, versus you go further east, Storm intensity and storm damage from from the marine side become extremely important. We're actually sitting almost in a sweet spot. I have to say this: there was a there was a poll. This caught everybody by surprise. I was here to do a quiz on this. I knew the answer the other day. What city? It was a city about climate perfectly adapt climate uh, ready cities. So where will everybody be moving in like the year 2100? You know where they're. You know, what's going to be the hot place? Where's going to be the next Seattle? And so, raise your hand if you know the answer. Detroit. <laughs> of course, <laughs> Detroit. Well, why is that? Well, you know, it's far from the coast. It's a nice mesic area. They've got the Great Lakes there. So, and we're sort of in the same. We're going to be in Detroit's sort of shadow. This is actually an area that's better buffered than most. But remember this, you know, we're, we sit in a global, we're in a global economy. We're in a global demographic. Can't insulate ourselves from that, but we can be sort of thankful for the fact that we are relatively buffered by virtue of storm, distance from storm and ample water. Another question? Yeah. Yeah, you know, sort of related to that, but with the National Climate Assessment and dealing with the vulnerability and adaptation of the forest, does it take any consideration test? You know, one of your keys is that the more diversity you have, the greater chance of higher resilience. You know, ash is the only thing that's going to affect other species. I think also the hickory now is going to. Yeah, well, you know, it's a lot more beetle than there. That's, these are a huge concern, but go oh, ahead. Yeah. Does it play, I mean, was any of that considered the National Climate Yeah, so the question is yeah, these climate assessments, the National Climate Assessment, and actually there's a very recent assessment on uh, the southern, uh, central Appalachian. 2015, same group of people looking at climate assessments, and they're looking, and we've got the hemlock woolly delgin, for example, of course, we've got the emerald ash borer, we've got other potential pests coming along. Um, so they do, the problem is that interaction, and, and it's so, it's, it's the, the confidence, your confidence in the predictions start to go down, or your uncertainty expand as you, as you attempt to layer on the, the vulnerability or the niche of the end of the pest, whatever it might be, or pathogen, and the niche of the host or the target, and how that those are moving. So it definitely is, they're definitely considered, and they're typically added on as additional stressors, or we would expect to see increased vulnerability with drought or heat stress, given any almost any sort of new new or for that matter. Uh, native, it could be a native pathogen. I mean, uh, the forest scent caterpillar, for example, is an interesting case. These eruptive insects. Uh, so, so it's sort of a qualified yes. And, and uh, this, this recent assessment of Ohio, of the Central Appalachian Forest, was very interesting in that regard because it's getting, it gets both storm, storm intensity on from the east, it's got pest and pathogens, it's got a very broad Niche space from high alpine, high elevation hemlock. So we've got in many cases we've got these northern species in the more northern distribution, like hemlock, for example, spruce, red spruce, really pretty in high vulnerability at the southern end of their range where we are here. On the other hand, if you're looking at some of the southern pine, people are starting to plant loblolly pine in southern Ohio. That's a niche space which is opening up. I'm pretty. I'm Pretty agnostic when it comes to which species. Uh, these are long-lived species; they can really handle a lot. They may not be regenerating. I don't really have a problem with moving southern species up if that you have the wherewithal to do that. 
But at the same time, I think actually many of the species that we've got have quite a lot of niche space that we're still working in. Um, and resilient, put into play something like the Emerald Ash Bar and it's sort of game over if, that's, if it's really something like the Ash, which is really fragile. We had a question online as well. Would you say that a forest with multiple professional stages with smaller billion than a Ah, that's a good question. So the question is, is a completely is a forest with multiple successional stages more resilient than old than an old growth forest? And this is an interesting controversy. And, and probably the easiest and the least satisfying question is we actually really don't know because there's so little old growth forest to actually study. Um, my, uh, if you were to um, have an opportunity managing very large landscapes um, to, and you were in control, you would want to maintain, make sure that you didn't lose entirely that early successional stage. In fact, those early growth stages and openings, for that matter, are important habitats for all sorts of organisms and add to that resilience. The other part, as, a, as a, somebody who studies older forests, we have so little of this that for the most part, when we're thinking old growth, or really true old growth is in the east is three or four hundred years old, and what we're arguing for more is a, is a system that really is middle age, that 125 to 150 year old mixed northern hardwood forest, of which there's almost none, and I think that's a, that's a stage which we need to continue to expand. There's plenty of early successional forests across our landscape. What we're really lacking is that that older forest that's more naturally, structurally complex. So it's an open question. We just, the old growth systems are so rare that we have very little data. We have only one of these towers, the only one that exists in an old growth forest. It's in the Sylvania track in the western UP. And uh, we're just starting to see that resilient characteristic. Our theory would predict that they'd be just as resilient, but that's open to question. Other questions? Yeah, I have a question. question. Um, my division of forestry is doing a lot of dirt cutting down in uh, southern Ohio. And I'm just I'm kind of wondering about the impact. The map that you showed it looks kind of similar to the way they're doing it. It's kind of like top marks, you know, across the forest. Um, yeah, well, that, that would be uh, so, so I, I'm not. In, in, so in large areas of clear cut, I think there's almost no. It's, these are driven entirely by, I think, outmoded economic models. Basically, it's an industrial approach, and it, it actually has almost has less to do with maximizing or wood return than maximizing um, uh, return on capital. Actually, and now you know your forested lands. I mean, it, it's complicated, and I'm not an expert in all those areas. But to, to restructure their clear cuts into something that's smaller areas, this is, this is a significant advance. And uh, certainly the Forest Service in, the, in Benton County, for example, has done some really pioneering work on using uh, controlled burns and other sort of management techniques. Um, we're still working, in my opinion, with very 100-year-old you know, models for or forest, or many of these silvicultural models really are, I think, in many cases, outmoded, or we need, we need other ones. There's, there's reasons why it's difficult to put those into play. I'm going to close with the last question. Um, any recommendations for, for urban areas? So Columbus has Green Memo 3 that's trying to implement a resilience of the tree canopy, it's called it the large tree canopy. We have actually near the arboretum, which was identified as the first urban arboretum in the country. What recommendations do you have for those systems going forward to try to maintain that canopy or enhance it? You know, diversity is like, hugely important. So um, maintaining a good mix of tree species uh, takes us outside the comfort zone in some cases uh, of your sort of standard, maybe have greatest curbside appeal, for example. Um, Increasing, you know, you, Columbus is pretty decent, although I think uh, we can do better. And simply increasing the 
tree can coverage, that would be an enormous first step. And I think, I think sometimes we think we're doing better than we are, and that's still the jury's still out a little bit on that. I've looked at some other measures. I think we might be in the 15 percent range or something like that. 18 percent. Some areas are high, like Flint and Mill, other areas. Yeah, but overall, I see numbers from places like Baltimore and parts of Boston, which are close to 30 percent. I looked at those of that. Muffin has got a long way to go to catch up, and so we just need more trees. Uh, the problem, of course, being if you, if you happen to plant all ash in your neighborhood, something comes along and they're all gone, so starting from scratch. Another key point, and we fought this battle, and I won't go on too long about this at Ohio State. It takes 100 years to grow a 100 year old tree, and so there's a way too much, oh, let's just take that, that nice big tree down, it's kind of in the way, and put a smaller one in. That doesn't cut it. We need to really preserve those big old trees. Do we need to do to make sure branches aren't falling on people and breaking up the park? But those trees are invaluable resources. And uh, we narrowly lost some beauties on the Ohio State campus from just people not thinking through their decisions about where to put roads. And uh, we need to pay much more attention to that. And that's going to add to that diversity and resilience, too. 100 year old trees are pretty tough. They've been there for 100 years. We've seen it we've seen a lot. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much.